because they finally get a chance to run. Then it starts feeling fun. All of a sudden, everybody don't remember nothing. That's one of Diddy's M.O. One of his former record executives met with him. And I guess he was trying to pray with him or whatever. But he tried to give him a pill. Well, he got a boss too, and his boss name is Clive Davis. Clive run him. Diddy don't run himself. With the investigations going on about Sean P. Diddy Combs, 50 Cent hasn't been holding back about all the questionable stuff Diddy's been tied to. Rumor has it that with all this coming out, folks close to Diddy are starting to sweat, worried they might get dragged into the mess too. One of those folks is Clive Davis, and according to 50 Cent, everything shady is about to come out in the open for Diddy and his crew. So what exactly did he spill? 50 Cent has always been vocal about Diddy's shady ways. In fact, there's a resurfaced comments about Diddy that came straight from 50 Cent himself, although it's more of a bizarre story. During an old interview, presumably a drink champ's appearance, he told the alleged story of how Diddy once told him that he wanted to take him shopping. He told me to take me shopping. I looked at him like, what the, what the, what'd you just say? <laughs> Let me move, man, before I do something. You gonna make me mess up the wet. That's one of Diddy's M.O. Fifth probably felt like Diddy was trying to get him into his shady intimate encounters with men. What's more, last year a spokesperson for 50 Cent told TMZ that the 48-year-old rapper's production company G-Unit Films and Television is working on a documentary about the accusations against Combs. They said the money made from the documentary will go to help victims of S.A. and R. Recently, Jackson gave a sneak peek of the documentary on Instagram. In the clip, former Bad Boy Records rapper Mark Curry claimed that Combs would secretly add something to bottles of Moet to make women in nightclubs more vulnerable. Curry said Combs would warn his friends not to drink from certain bottles. In addition, while talking about the documentary, Jackson criticized rapper Rick Ross and Combs. He posted lyrics from Ross's song Yo Eno, where Ross talks about putting in a woman's drink without her knowing. The idea of making a documentary called Surviving Diddy started as a joke online, but now many people support it. On November 18th, a poster of Combs sitting on a couch with the title Surviving Puffy and the Netflix logo appeared on Facebook, leading people to believe a documentary about the music mogul was in the works. Meanwhile, 50 First insinuated that he was considering making a movie called Surviving P. Diddy on November 20th. His suggestion came in the wake of Cassie's lawsuit against the Grammy winner, followed by another lawsuit filed against Diddy's colleague and former bad boy label president Harve Pierre on the grounds of AB. In fact, 50 Cent took to his Instagram and posted a since-deleted screenshot of a headline about Pierre's lawsuit, followed by the caption, I told you they were coming in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. This is a movie, Surviving P. Diddy or Diddy, Do It or Not, executive produced by Curtis 50 Cent Jackson coming soon. While the fake Netflix poster of Diddy may have been fan-made, 50 Cent meant that the film on the No Way Out rapper would be under legal scrutiny, just like the 2019 documentary titled Surviving R. Kelly. It was made on the R&B singer who has since been convicted and imprisoned following AB allegations similar to those of Diddy. For context, in February, Combs's former producer and videographer filed a federal lawsuit against the mogul, alleging Combs harassed and threatened him. According to the lawsuit, Rodney Lil Rod Jones worked on Combs' most recent album, Love, and lived with him between September 2022 and November 2023. Jones alleges he was the victim of constant, unsolicited, and unauthorized touching of his A by Mr. Combs. On one occasion, the lawsuit claims, Jones woke up naked and disoriented in bed with Combs and two S workers. He alleges the music mogul him. The complaint also claims that, in his role as Combs's videographer, Jones secured hundreds of hours of footage and audio recordings of Mr. Combs, his staff, and his guests engaging in serious illegal activity. The illegal activity the suit alleges includes acquiring <laughs> soliciting S workers, providing drinks to minors, and S.A. Jones's suit names several other defendants, including Combs's son Justin, Combs's chief of staff, Christina Corum, Universal Music Group CEO Sir Lucian Grange, and former Motown Records CEO Ethiopia Habtamarium. Combs's lawyer, Sean Hawley, denied Jones's allegations. We have overwhelming, indisputable proof that his claims are complete lies, she told People. In his suit, Jones says that he feared Combs was him, and that fear became a reality when actor Cuba Gooding Jr. allegedly assaulted him during an outing on the music mogul's yacht. The actor began touching and fondling Mr. Jones' legs, his upper inner thighs near his groin, the small of his back near his 
and his shoulders, the complaint alleges. Mr. Jones was extremely uncomfortable and proceeded to lean away from Mr. Gooding Jr. He rejected his advances, and Mr. Gooding Jr. did not stop until Mr. Jones forcibly pushed him away. An amended version of the lawsuit filed in late March names Gooding Jr. as a defendant, people reported. The lawsuit also says that Combs's circle enabled his behavior in order to have access to celebrities that he knew and socialized with. Mr. Combs was known for throwing the best parties, the suit reads. Anyway, following all these allegations, on March 25th, federal agents raided the music mogul's residences in Los Angeles and Miami. NBC News reported that the search warrants are connected to a federal investigation into allegations of STSA and the solicitation and distribution of illegal narcotics and firearms. Federal agents in New York have also spoken with at least four Jane Doe's and one John Doe as part of the investigation, with more interviews to come. In a statement, Combs's attorney Aaron Dyer said there was a gross overuse of military-level force during the execution of the search warrants. Mr. Combs was never detained but spoke to and cooperated with authorities. Despite media speculation, neither Mr. Combs nor any of his family members have been arrested, nor has their ability to travel been restricted in any way, he said. While authorities have not said whether Combs is a subject of the alleged ST investigation, Dyer connected the raids to the lawsuits against the rapper. This unprecedented paired with an advanced, coordinated media presence, leads to a premature rush to judgment of Mr. Combs and is nothing more than a witch hunt based on meritless accusations made in civil lawsuits, he said in the statement. There has been no finding of or civil liability with any of these allegations. Mr. Combs is innocent and will continue to fight every single day to clear his name. In any case, there are several people who are currently terrified following the raid and ongoing investigations against Diddy. One of those people is Clive Davis. You see, what most people don't know is that Diddy actually had a mentor that molded him into the person he is today. Most of you should have heard about the powerful music executive Clive Davis and his contribution to hip-hop. Clive Davis was behind artists like TLC, Whitney Houston, and Brandy back in the 90s. Clive Davis actually signed Diddy to a label deal for Bad Boy after Diddy convinced him that hip-hop was going to be the next big mainstream music. The story goes, Diddy was fired from Uptown Records and was looking for a new home for his record company, Bad Boy. This is when Diddy ended up meeting Clive Davis, who decided to fund Diddy's Bad Boy vision. Taking Diddy under his wing and mentoring him. After becoming Clive's prodigy, Diddy became the mega hip-hop executive and mogul he is today, reaching heights he wouldn't be able to without a man like Clive Davis behind him. Now, the industry for many years has been talking about this meeting between Diddy and Clive Davis, claiming that Diddy did way more than just show music to Clive. According to many in the industry, it was believed that in the 1990s meeting, Diddy actually got on his knees for Clive Davis and did some extracurricular activities for him. It is also alleged that Diddy would then then end up secretly dating Clive during this time for five years. For years, this has remained an unconfirmed industry rumor that no one really had any proof of for the longest. Well, that all changed back in 2013 when Clive Davis himself wrote in his memoir that he was indeed a bi man who was into men and women, openly confessing that he had secretly dated many men within the industry. This, for most, confirmed the rumors that Diddy had to pay a dark price for his success. It appears that Diddy learned all of his dark, shady tactics from his mentor Clive Davis. Clive Davis Davis took advantage of Diddy just how Diddy takes advantage of artists today. Some of you should remember the allegations made by Jaguar Wright against Diddy. She claimed that a former lawyer who worked for Diddy had revealed to her some very disturbing information. Wright said that Diddy had a meeting with singer and New Jack City actor Christopher Williams about possibly signing a deal. The attorney in question needed to get approval for some paperwork and went to Diddy's office to speak with him. Jaguar claims the lawyer said the door wasn't locked so she didn't think twice about just walking in. When she walked in, she saw Christopher Williams performing a little extra for Diddy. This story by Jaguar Wright, although unconfirmed, was believed by many as they don't put it past Diddy. What gives this story more validation is that Jaguar isn't the only person alleging that Diddy was into these kinds of activities. A Vine creator named Jay Versace also revealed that he had an intimate encounter with Diddy. Jay Versace alleged that Diddy invited him to his mansion when Diddy was at the peak of his career. Jay made these claims in response to a post showing women having fun on Diddy. 
Diddy's big outdoor bed. Jay said that Diddy had him bent over that same bed. It seems that Diddy learned these behaviors from Clive Davis, who introduced him to the industry. Another thing Clive Davis might have taught Diddy is how to deal with artists who cause trouble. You see, some people online allege that Clive Davis got rid of artists he had problems with, like Whitney Houston. In fact, recent revelations are now showing that Clive might have actually benefited more from Whitney's demise compared to when she was alive. Because there's a clause in record contracts that allows record labels to cash in even more after an artist's passing. You see, the world of music contracts is a labyrinth in maze, riddled with complexities that often escape public scrutiny. Hank Harrison, a muckraking reporter, is someone that appears to have stumbled upon a chilling discovery buried deep within artists' contracts, the infamous death clause. This clandestine clause, also referred to as a non-performance or failure of performance clause, raises eyebrows due to its alarming implications. Companies shall have the right to secure insurance equivalent to 10 times the estimated value of the artist's earnings. This clause, as unearthed by Harrison, is a contractual provision that grants recording companies the astonishing power to rake in immense profits, even in the face of an artist's untimely demise. In short, here is what a death clause does in my humble opinion. If an artist fails to perform or pay back advances, the artist becomes more profitable dead. This seemingly nefarious maneuver ensures that record labels are entitled to claim not only their investments, but also a substantial portion of the artist's earnings from various revenue streams. The mechanism, shrouded in secrecy, empowers companies to secure hefty insurance policies against the artist's projected earnings, effectively making them beneficiaries of the artist's life and death. The inception of the death clause dates back to an era where the corridors of power were controlled by shadowy figures, reminiscent of scenes from the silver screen. It appears that this clause was designed to guarantee the label's financial security and influence, even if it meant profiting off the demise of an artist. In essence, the clause suggests that an artist who fails to meet performance obligations or repay advances becomes an even more lucrative asset in death. Intriguingly, this malevolent clause has evolved over time, adopting a subtler facade while maintaining its exploitative essence. Once valued in thousands, it now holds the potential to be worth billions, owing to the colossal investments labels make in nurturing and promoting burgeoning talents. The insurance policies procured under this clause serve as a safeguard against potential losses in the event of an artist's incapacity or demise, thereby safeguarding the label's investments and projected profits. Amidst this maelstrom of revelations, speculation has begun to swirl around the extent of Clive Davis's involvement with the death clause. As a mastermind behind the success of many artists, including Whitney Houston, questions arise about whether he reaped any benefits from the tragic loss of his prized protege. While no concrete evidence has surfaced linking Davis directly to this exploitative clause, artists and insiders have started to come forward, painting a troubling picture of his role in potentially capitalizing on the grim provisions of the clause. Whispers have transformed into outspoken voices, as several artists shed light on their experiences within the clutches of the music industry's dark underbelly. Their stories echo the same sentiment, that the death clause, once a well-guarded secret, is not a relic of the past, but a contemporary reality. It has been alleged that Davis and and other industry magnates might have leveraged this clause to their advantage, using it as a financial safety net against unforeseen losses. One person who spoke about this is avant-garde musician, Diamanda Gallus. Houston's tragic demise, Gallus took to her Facebook page, calling the record executive a colossal pig. According to Gallus, Houston should have been allowed to study for a minimum of two years with a voice therapist or teacher before even rehearsing, let alone performing, on stage. In the entry, she claimed that the singer was put back on stage before she was ready to perform by Davis. Gallus wrote that Houston was ill-prepared to perform, writing, what was she put on stage as? A lesson that's substances unalive? Hey, wanna see a crack ho sing? Courtesy of Clive Davis. Wow, man, that will be some freaky right? You bet, man. Gallus didn't stop there, claiming that Davis could now quote-unquote package her death in frills and sell it big time, even during the nadir of record sales. She even went so far as to claim to foresee what the 79-year-old record industry vet would say in response. And Clive and Sony will say, even though we do not hope to even break even with this uncompromising tribute to Whitney Houston, we feel personally that it is her due as the foremost singer ever on our labels and as the lovely girl she always was to us. At the time, a 
spokesman for Davis responded by saying, While Ms. Galas is entitled to her uninformed opinion, her Facebook post is wholly inaccurate and offensive. Clive Davis cherished Whitney and shares a mutual love for the Houston family. It is absolutely outrageous for anyone to suggest that Mr. Davis ever had anything but Whitney's best interest at heart. If you think it's only Gallus making these insinuations, you'd be wrong. Gallus's comments were echoed by Jaguar Wright in a recent interview where she claimed that Davis knew he needed Whitney back under his control, and that's why he was forcing her to have a comeback. He needed her back. Oh, yeah. He needed her back but he needed her back and under his control. For context, Clive orchestrated Whitney's comeback in 2009 after years of Substance AB and a messy relationship which ended in a messy divorce. Her debut album, I Look To You, sold 304,000 copies in its first seven days on the market, sending Houston back to the top of the charts and giving her the best debut week of her career. Houston still stands for the best of songwriting, the best of singing, and we know the public wants it, Clive said in 2009. There is a song on this album which is called I Didn't Know My Own Strength, and it really speaks for Whitney. She tumbled, but she didn't crumble. In any case, Whitney did not release anything after that since her voice had been ruined due to substance AB, much to Clive's disappointment. But despite the undeniable vocal decline and the unmistakable shadow cast over Whitney's star power, Clive's optimism seemingly remained unscathed. Of course, one might wonder if his rosy outlook was fueled by the substantial coin he continued to rake in from her legacy. It's difficult not to speculate whether Clive's unwavering hope was propelled by the echoes of revenue streams rather than genuine concern. In any case, it was no secret that the music mogul appeared to be more invested in making money than in his protege's well-being. You see, Whitney died on February 11, 2012, the day before the Grammy Awards. This was hours before she was to attend Davis's annual pre-Grammy party. At the time, the public and lovers of her music worldwide were devastated by her passing. However, Davis, Whitney's self-proclaimed friend and mentor, still hosted his pre-Grammy party in the Beverly Hilton Hotel on the the evening of February 11th, despite the singer's body remaining inside the building until 12.45 a.m. At the start of the event, he shared a tribute to Houston saying, By now you have all learned of the unspeakably tragic news of our beloved Whitney's passing. I don't have to mask my emotion in front of a room full of so many dear friends. The Grammy Award winner continued, I am personally devastated by the loss of someone who has meant so much to me for so many years. Whitney was so full of life. She was so looking forward to tonight even though she wasn't scheduled to perform. Whitney was a beautiful person and a talent beyond compare. She graced this stage with her regal presence and gave so many memorable performances here over the years. Simply put, Whitney would have wanted the music to go on and her family asked that we carry on. Whitney Houston's death on the eve of the Grammys in 2012 came as a horrific shock, if not entirely without warning. The platinum-selling singer and actress was to attend Clive Davis's annual pre-Grammys bash at the Beverly Hilton that night, but instead, she died in a room upstairs after accidentally drowning in the bathtub. It was reported at the time that the LA County Coroner's Office noted in its post-mortem findings that a white crystal-like substance was found in the room. There was also an open bottle of pain and other personal items believed to belong to the late song stress. An autopsy was performed with the official cause of death listed as accidental drowning with atherosclerotic heart disease and use, just probably immediately prior to the drowning listed among contributing factors. In any case, although there's no solid proof connecting Clive to Whitney's death or being involved in Diddy's accusations, one thing is clear. Clive had some kind of negative impact on his artists. Particularly Diddy and fans are eager for that truth to come out. Anyway, that's it for this video, folks. Bye.